Okay, good morning, uh, everyone. Shalom, praise the Lord. Uh, welcome to class. Uh, we'll continue our study of Romans chapter 8. We uh, stopped at um, uh, Romans chapter 8, verse um, uh, 24. We looked at 24 to verse 27, uh, and the very you know promising verse in 26 uh, and 27 that we studied. Um, last week. We'll continue from there on with a quick recap and move on to verse 28. So can I ask one of you, uh, those of you who have joined us online to lead us in prayer, please? Anyone? Lead us in prayer? Nina John, can you lead us in prayer, please? Gracious, loving Father, you're able to hear me? Yes, we can. Okay. Gracious, loving Father, thank you so much uh, for this day that you have given us, Lord, and for this time to come together uh, at, at your feet in your presence, Lord, to study your word. We thank you, Lord, for the way you have been speaking to us and enriching us uh, through your word and what in what we are learning. We pray today also, Lord, because Pastor Selina and each one of us into your hands, we pray, Holy Spirit, you will open the eyes of our understanding. Uh, when, we do, when we know, Lord, when you open our eyes, we see wonderful things in your law. And we know that the entrance of your word brings light. We pray, uh, committing each one of us into your hands and uh, that we would have a blessed time with you in your presence. For we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you. So we looked at uh, verse 26 and verse 27 last week. It says, likewise, the Spirit helps us in our weakness, for we do not know what we ought to pray for. But the Spirit himself makes intercession for us with groanings which cannot be uttered. And verse 27, for he who searches the hearts knows what the mind of the Spirit is, because he makes intercession for the saints according to the will of uh, God. So we said that it's not the Holy Spirit going away somewhere and uh, praying for us, but here the, the word helps in Greek literally means to take hold together with uh, and against. So the Holy Spirit takes a hold of us or together with us and against our weakness, he helps us to uh, intercede. Okay, so we said, who is having the weakness? It's the believers, the saints. And who is helping us in the prayer? It's the Holy Spirit. He prays along with us, together with us, okay, against our weakness. And how is he helping us? He's helping us by making intercession. And who is doing the intercession? The intercession is being done by the believer with the help of the Holy Spirit. And where is the intercession coming from? The intercession ca is coming from the heart of the believer. And who is listening to our intercession? It is God. Okay. So God looks into the heart of the believer. Okay. And he knows what the Holy Spirit is saying, even though it can be just groaning, uh, moaning, uh, uh, utterances, speaking in, the, in tongues. Because the, uh, God knows the mind of the Holy Spirit, or the Holy Spirit knows the mind of God as well. So this intercession is being made according to the will of God. Okay. So in the light of this, Romans 8.28, you know, we can say that all things work for the good of those who love God and who are called according to his purpose okay so what paul is saying here is there are sufferings in this present time we are going through these sufferings but this is our expectation what is our expectation that somehow there will be god's purposes being brought about even through the sufferings of the present time that we are going through okay he's talking about the sufferings in the flesh also, he's talking about sufferings in terms of challenges, uh, persecutions, difficulties that we face. And he says, even as we go through all of these sufferings, we have this expectation, we have this hope that God's purposes will be brought about even through our suffering of the present time that we are going through. Okay, why? Because 
I love God and I'm called according to his purpose. And because I love God and I'm called according to his purpose, all things will work for good. Okay, so what is this purpose he's talking about? This purpose he's talking about is in verses 29 and uh, 30. Okay, so verses 29 and 30. Francis, can you read that, please? Verses 29 and 30. Oh, verse 29 and 30. For whom he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his son, that he might be firstborn among many brethren, Moreover, whom he predestined, these he also called, whom he called, these he also justified, and whom he justified, these he also glorified. Amen. So here he's saying, for whom God foreknew is basically refers to the omniscience of God. Oh, God is all knowing. So it says, who he foreknew, he predestined. So who God foreknew, he also predestined. Now to be predestined means that something that he planned before time. Okay. Now he, God knew beforehand and decided beforehand. So what did he predestine? What did he decide beforehand? What did he know beforehand? He did not know, he did not predestine, sorry, he did not predestine the choices that we will make. But he predestined, what did he predestine? He predestined that those who choose him will be conformed to the image of his son. Okay. So God does not predestine the choices that we make, but he knows beforehand, even before we make the choice, even before we were born on this earth, he know the choices that we would make. And he knew who is going to choose him and who is going to deny him or who is going to not put their faith and trust in him. So those who he already knows are going to choose him, those he's already predestined that they will be conformed to the image of their, of his son. You see? So God knew before time our choices. So we are the ones who are making the choices. We can't think, we can't say that, you know, God predestines the choices that we make. It's not God who predestines the choices that we are make, we are making in life. It is we who are making the choices. Okay. And so he knows beforehand who will believe in Jesus and those he knows he's already predestined that they will be conformed to the image of his son, Jesus uh, Christ. Okay. Um, and he says that they will be the firstborn among brethren, that we should be like the brethren, that is Jesus, or we will be like Jesus. Okay. Romans 8.30 says, Moreover, whom he predestined, and those he these he also called, whom he called, these he also justified, and whom he justified, these he also glorified. So all who become like Jesus are the ones who would become the called of God. So the question is, does God only call those he predestines or does he call everyone or is the invitation extended to everyone and those who respond to the invitation are those who are called? What do you think is the answer? I'll repeat that again. All who become like Jesus, they are the ones who will be who will become the called, right? Because they have believed in Jesus, they've chosen him, and God has predestined that they would conform to the image of his son. So the question is, does God only call those he predestines to be conformed to the image of his son? Or does he call everyone? Is the invitation extended to everyone? And those who respond to the invitation are the ones who are called. What do you think is the answer? Does God call everyone? Yes, the God will call everyone. Like, and I, I like to go with the last option, which is like, whoever like responds for that, it is called. They are the called. Okay. So yes, does the call? Does God call everyone? Yes, is the invitation or the call to receive Jesus Christ as the Lord and Savior for everyone? Yes, the invitation is for 
everyone. Okay, but there are some schools of thought that say that God already predestined things. They say that He pre predestined who are going to be saved. And they will be the called. And he predestined those who will not be saved and who are going to go to hell. Now, what do you think about this? Is that right or wrong? Does God call few and predestine that they will go to heaven? And does he determine that the rest of them will go to hell? What do you all think? No? Yes? The Bible no. does not teach us? Yes. It's, it's a no. Big. He, uh, there's a word, scripture in Peter which says, no, that he desires that all should come to repentance. So, Yes. It's God's good, pleasing, and perfect will that all men be saved and come to the knowledge of Jesus Christ. So that school of thought is wrong. The school of thought that says, hey, God already predestined who are going to be saved and they are going to be the called. Now, if this is true, there is, there's no need for us to be busy in our lives to go and preach the gospel right if already god is going to predestine those who are going to be saved they will be saved automatically because god is already predestined right and those who are not going to be saved they're going to be going to hell they'll automatically just go to hell so there is no need for us to share the gospel but this is not what the new testament tells us what does the new testament teach us it teaches us to go into all the world to preach teach and make disciples of all nations okay we are to ask to go and preach the gospel to every creature okay the invitation is open to all because john 3 16 says god so loved the world you know he gave his only son whoever believes in him so the invitation is open to all god loved the world whoever believes in him will receive eternal life okay so the ones who believe they will become the called and those who believe who become the called they will be justified god will justify them which means they become righteous because they have accepted jesus christ as the lord and savior and those he justified he will also glorify which means you know he's already shared about this how will we glory be glorified in the preceding verses he said that we will become hairs and joint hairs with jesus christ okay so that is what uh, he means when he's talking about this in predestination in chapter verses 29 and verse 30. We look at that more in chapter uh, 9. Okay. So uh, now in the rest of these verses in chapter 8 from verses 31 to 39, Paul wraps up and goes into a celebratory uh, proclamation where Paul is saying, that you know all that god has done so far what everything that he has written the full gospel what god has done for us you know he's saying i'm celebrating everything that god has done for us so that is what he's wrapping up this entire uh, chapter with so can somebody please read verses 31 to 39 please anyone quickly Yeah, read. Yes. I was 31 to 37. 39. Sorry, 39. What then shall we say to these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? He who did not spare his own son, but delivered him up for us all, how shall he not with him also freely give us all things? Who shall bring a charge against God's elect? It is God who justifies, who is who condemns, it is Christ who died, and furthermore is also risen, who is even at the right hand of God, who also makes intercession for us, who shall separate us from the love of Christ, shall tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or peril or sword, as it is written, for your sake we are killed all day long. We are accounted as sheep for the slaughter. Yet in all these things we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am persuaded that neither death nor life, nor angels nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present nor things to come, 
nor height or nor depth, nor any other created things shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen. Such wonderful promises in uh, these passages, uh, uh, this passage of scripture in these verses from uh, 31 to 39. Okay, so he's Paul is ending up this chapter by putting everything together and he's asking again uh, four rhetorical questions like he's done in the past where he asked a question that he thinks will rise up in the mind of his readers and he himself answers the question okay so verse 31 he says what then shall we say to these things the first question here if god is for us who can be against us so he says we know that we are all going through suffering in the present time and we know that we are all facing hardship whether it's in the flesh or whether it's persecutions you know challenges and difficulties so he's saying so what is our what should be our response to all of this our response He's saying is, if God is for us, who can be against us? Amen. So he's saying this is the first assurance that even though we go through challenges and difficulties, if God is for us, who can be against us? Now, the other thing is in uh, Romans 8.32, where he says, He who did not spare his own son, but delivered him up for us all, how shall he not with him also freely give us all things so he says we have this assurance you know what is the assurance we have this assurance of god's presence that god is for us nothing can be against us or come against us and he says we have this assurance of god's not only god's presence but also assurance of god's provision that god did not hold back his own son when he did not hold back his own son, how will he not also graciously, along with his son, give us everything that we need? So Paul is saying, while we are going through these sufferings in the present time, and while we are waiting for the adoption of the glorious redemption of the glorious liberty that is up ahead, which he's spoken in the previous verses, he's saying, you know, now if God is for me, he will provide for me. Okay. When God gave his son, he will also along with him give me all things. So God will provide for me, God will be with me, and God's presence and God's provision will be my provision. Amen. So what is the believer's reaction even as we journey through life? The believer's reaction even as we journey through life is, hey, God's presence is with me. His presence is there if, and God is for me. And when God gave his only son along with him, when he provided the very best for me, along with him, he will provide everything that I need for my life and for my situation. Okay. So the next question he asks is in uh, verse 33. He says, who shall bring a charge against God's elect? It is God who justifies. So Paul has explained the whole truth of justification and he sums it up with this. He says, look, God has justified you and me and there is no more accusation against us. Amen. Because God has already justified us. There is no condemnation. There is no accusation. And he starts this chapter saying there is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Okay. And verse 34, who is he who condemns? It's Christ who died and furthermore is also risen, who is even at the right hand of God, who also makes intercession for us. So Paul has already explained to us that Christ died, is buried, you know, uh, uh, resurrected, ascended and seated at the right hand of the Father and he's there making intercession for us. So we live with the sense that, hey, you know, I'm justified, you know, I'm the called of God, I'm justified, you know, and the one who justified me is at the right hand of the father so there is no way any condemnation or any accusation against me shall prevail why because jesus christ is the right hand of the father and he is interceding for me and he is fighting on my behalf okay verse 35 who shall separate us from the love of christ shall tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or peril or soul so 
we read in Romans chapter 5, verses 1 to 5, Paul says there that hope does not disappoint us. Why does hope not disappoint us? Because the love of God has been poured into our hearts. So this hope is consolidated, it is strengthened because God's love is being poured out into our hearts. And so here it says, you know, uh, Paul is saying that, hey, because that love is being poured out into my heart, he's saying, I am so assured of this love and that is why I have this hope, okay? Hope that he has has been undergirded by this love that has been poured out into our hearts. And he's saying, so because we are confident of this love, we have this hope, we have this assurance. What is the hope and assurance? One of them is that nothing, Okay, no tribulations, no distress, no persecution, nakedness, sword, peril, you know, uh, nothing can, uh, neither death nor life, angels nor demons, present nor future, nothing can separate us from the love that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. And so this is the hope that we have, that when we face difficulties and situations in life, we can have this hope because God's love is being poured out in our lives. And... Um, uh, and verse 39, he says, you know, nothing uh, will separate us from the love that is in Christ Jesus. So he says, whether it is natural things, whether it's spiritual things, he says, the love of God, which is being poured out into our hearts, we know that nothing can separate us from that love. And whatever we are going through, we are going to come out as more than conquerors. Amen. Which means Paul is saying that we are not just victorious, but we are more than conquerors. And whatever we go through in life, we are going to come out victorious, okay? We are going to come out more than conquerors and nothing can separate us from the love that is in Christ Jesus. And he says, this is what gives us the hope. So this is what he summarizes chapters 5 to 8 very, very beautifully, okay? So this is chapter 8 for us. Any questions before we move on to chapter 9? Any questions, any doubts anyone has? Uh, this fact about Jesus interceding for us, so that would refer to what? I mean, I think that's 35, right? Yes, Jesus no, interceding for 34. us. Uh -huh. So when we say interceding for us in uh, like, I mean, what do we understand by that? So here in this context, he's saying, you know, there is no condemnation for those, uh, you know, uh, in Christ, because he's saying, you know, uh, this, uh, Jesus is the right hand. And even if there's any condemnation that is being brought about for us, he is the one who is interceding. You know, um, like John chapter 16, it says the Holy Spirit convicts the world. The ruler of the world has been judged. The verdict has been pronounced and there is no more court case against us. So Jesus is there interceding and saying, hey, you know, like I have paid the price. Uh, the person has been justified. The person has, uh, you know, um, has been uh, uh, acquitted of all sins. Um, uh, what is the other word for justification? Uh, I'm not getting that word. Not sanctification. Or made righteous, okay? Justified is just like we have never sinned. And so he is interceding on behalf of us for that, yes. It's not connecting with the, what the Holy Spirit, uh, you know, when he prays and intercedes along with us, against us, uh, which we looked at in verse 27 and 28. Did that help? Nina John? Yeah, uh, yes, I heard. So it is not, I mean, obviously, it's not like the Holy, the function of the Holy Spirit. Uh, Here it's talking but, about Jesus. Yes, I know. Yes, so yes. then it's kind of confirming what has already been done for us. Is that it? Yes, or? yes. Yes. Okay. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Okay. Any other questions? 
before we move on to chapter 9 very interesting chapter chapter 9 Okay, so Paul has uh, brought us to this point of justification uh, in Christ, our identification and how we can overcome and live victorious life in the midst of suffering. And, uh, you know, uh, chapters 9 to 11 are very interesting chapters because he's focusing on a totally different theme uh, where he's talking about, uh, you know, uh, the Jews and their calling Okay, so um, he's turning our attention to God's plan for Israel. Okay, and uh, Paul is in these chapters also sharing his own heart, his heart feelings for his own people, the people of Israel, the Jewish people, the Jewish race, even as he recognizes that he has a calling for uh, to be an apostle to the Gentiles, but he still has a deep burden for his own uh, people. Okay, so... Um, here, you know, um, uh, the main issue being addressed in these three chapters, 9, 10, 11, is that, you know, since salvation is by grace through faith in Jesus Christ, and all, including the Jews and Gentiles, have an access to this, what happens to the Jewish people? Okay, now, we thought it was only for the Jews, but no, Gentiles are also included. What happened to what happens to the Jewish people? So Paul helps us to understand that while the gospel is being preached and being received by the Gentiles, God has not given up on the Jewish people. They're still very much part of his plan. They are also presently a, a remnant, you know, who have received the gospel. And he's, there will be a time when God will move powerfully among the Jewish people and get them back, you know, to receive the gospel that is in Jesus um, Christ. So very interesting chapters in chapter 9 to 11, because he's focusing on a different theme, because he, in Rome there were Jews and Gentiles. And so the whole question he's asking here and will come up in the mind of the Jewish believers is, hey, what is God doing with the Jews. Okay. And also these uh, chapters 9 to 11 are very unique chapters because it's not discussed anywhere else in the New Testament. There may be a verse or two here and there in other epistles, but very uniquely, very, uh, you know, uh, elaborately discussed here in these chapters. Okay. Um, so Paul is basically mentioning here, what is God doing with the Jews or with the Jewish people? Okay, and these um, verses are interesting because how beautifully Paul presents the truth to uh, to the Jews and, you know, e even to us, even as we read it today. So the question is, has God abandoned the Jews, those who have not accepted uh, Jesus as the Messiah? Because has he abandoned the Jews because of the church, you know, uh, the people whom he has now predestined to be conformed to the image of his son so who are the people who are called it is the believers and the believers are the body of christ the church the saints and they are uh, you know like we already saw in the in the in chapter 8 god has predestined that they'll be conformed to the image of his son so paul's question or the question that will rise up in the mind of the uh, jews is what should be the church's attitude towards the jewish people Okay. Yes. Now, some of the people, uh, you know, left Judaism. They embraced Jesus Christ, and they are still wondering, "Hey, I'm following Jesus, who is a Jew, and a descendant of Abraham, and we are all descendants of Abraham as Jewish from the Jewish race, but we have, you know, now become believers." Okay. And we believe in Jesus as the Messiah, and we are now part of the church, and we are also called and justified. But what about the remaining Jewish brethren who have not accepted the Lord Jesus Christ? What is you know God going to do with the Jews? So the whole idea of predestination comes back again in these uh, chapters. So chapters 9 to 11 are pretty strong chapters in addressing predestination because God chooses the Jewish people ahead of time and he called Abraham and he gave him the promises of blessing and God did all this even before the church came into existence. So even as the church now are the body of Christ or conformed to the image of the Son, what about the Jews? How does the church relate to the Jews 
and what happened to the plan of God for the Jews and how was he going to do it and work with them. Okay, so chapters 9 to 11, Paul is addressing about this, what about the Jews and what is God doing with them. Okay, so can somebody please read verses 1 to 5? Anyone? Nina Santosh, can you read verses 1 to 5, please? That's okay yes, with you? Yeah, 1 to 5. I tell the truth in Christ. I'm not lying. My conscience also bearing me witness in the Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit, that I have great sorrow and continual grief in my heart. For I could wish that I myself were accursed from Christ for my brethren, my countrymen, according to the flesh, who are Israelites, to whom pertain the adoption, the glory, the covenants, the giving of the law, the service of, the service of God, and the promises, of whom are the fathers, and from whom, according to the flesh, Christ came, who is overall the eter eternally blessed God. Amen. Amen. Thank you. So verse 1, he says, I tell the truth in Christ. Okay. So Paul is saying, I want to share something that is in my heart. Or he's saying, I'm unburdening my heart to you. Because he's saying, my heart is filled with sorrow and continual grief. Okay, we'll come back to verse 2. We'll just go to verse 3 and then come back to verse 2. Okay, it says in verse 3, For I could wish that I myself were a curse from Christ for my brethren, my countrymen, according to the flesh. So what is his heart? Why is his heart filled with sorrow and continual grief? Because this verse shows us that how much he longs for his own people, the Jews, to come to know Christ. Okay. Literally, it means, you know, or what Paul is saying here, literally, you know, is that, you know, hey, uh, he's saying that, hey, I don't mind going to hell as long as the Jews can come to Jesus. So this is a burden he's carrying for the Jews, which is very similar to Moses, what Moses said in Exodus chapter 32, verses 31 and 32, where he says, you know, Moses says, you know, um, uh, he was willing to have his name blotted out of God's book so that Israel could be forgiven, so that the people can be uh, forgiven. Okay. So in verse 1, he says, my conscience bearing witness with the Holy Spirit. He says, I tell you the truth in Christ. I'm not lying. My conscience also bearing me witness in the Holy uh, Spirit. Okay. So, uh, what is the meaning of that? So it means that, you know, our conscience bears witness uh, and the Holy Spirit also bears witness. Okay. He's saying that his conscience bears witness and the Holy Spirit also bears witness. Now, what is a conscience? A conscience is the voice of our own spirit, right? Now, the co our conscience has been pre-programmed by God to know what is right and what is wrong right so even a, a small child you don't have to teach a small child you know to lie or to get angry or to throw tem tem temper tantrums and when the child knows when it's lied or you know uh, uh, you know disobeyed a child knows that they have done something wrong why because they have a conscience and their conscience is all already pre-programmed by god to know what is right and wrong okay so the holy spirit is also bearing witness so there are two that is bearing witness in our lives what are the two one is our conscience and the other is the holy spirit now how does the holy spirit bear witness in us it is either giving us peace or there is restlessness okay so Yes, our conscience is pre-programmed to know what is right and wrong, but the Holy Spirit also bears witness in our conscience. And how is that? You know, when we are doing something right or want to take the step or to make the decision or the choice, when we have a peace, you know, about it, we know that, hey, this is the Holy Spirit telling us to go ahead, to get into it, to get into the job, uh, to do this, to do that. But in this restlessness, we know that the Holy Spirit is trying to tell us this is not the right opportunity, this is not the right person, this is not the right connect, this is not the right thing to uh, do. Okay, So it's wonderful when both the our conscience and the Holy Spirit is in 
agreement. So when my spirit is in complete agreement with the Holy Spirit, then there is a jointly uh, testifying about something. You know, it really helps to know, to make the decision. There's that assurance. And this brings about strong conviction. This brings complete assurance and togetherness about a matter. But, uh, so in this case, it is his heart for the Jewish people. Okay. Um, so, you know, we can feel Paul's burden because he's talking about his grief, his, his sorrow for his own uh, people who are not accepting Jesus as the Messiah and not receiving the gospel. So though Paul was appointed to preach the gospel to the Gentiles, he still had a heart and a burden for his own people. And who are those people? The Jews. Okay. So Paul, by saying all of these things, he's setting himself up you know, for what he is going to say, okay? He's saying, hey, I'm an apostle to the church of Jesus Christ, and I'm also a Jew. And he's saying, hey, I also have a heart for my own people. In fact, I'm deeply burdened, sorrowing for my own people. So he's positioning himself because he's going to talk about this in the next three chapters about the Jews and the church and he wants to know once people were reading this especially the, the jews to know from which perspective he is speaking this from he's speaking this from a perspective that he has a heart and a burden for the jewish people okay verse 4 he says who are israelites to whom pertain uh, the adoption the glory the covenants the giving of the law the service of god and the promises so adoption here is you know god chose the jews or the israelites to be his own nation to be his own people in this world and they experienced or they got to see his glory they were the ones who received the law the covenants the promises and the priesthood okay and later on, Paul says, you know, the blessings that were theirs were also passed on to the Gentiles. But he's starting off, look at where he's starting off. He's starting off from where God started. Where did God start? He God started by choosing the Jewish race. So now he's getting into this whole discussion about, you know, uh, God, what God is doing with the Jews. So he's starting off where they are. He's saying, yes, God has chosen you, okay, and he's given you all of these things. What has he given you? The law, the commandments, the promises, the priesthood that the Jews hold on very, you know, zealously with pride. Okay, he says, he, God has given you all of this. Verse 9, he says, of whom are the fathers and from whom, according to flesh, Christ came, who is over all eternally blessed God. Amen. So for the Jewish people, you know, um, their father, who was their forefathers? Abraham, Isaac and Jacob, David as well, okay? And he says, Jesus Christ in the natural came from the same race, came from the same nation. So he says the Jews or the Israelites were so privileged because, you know, why were they privileged? Because not only they had all of these things, the laws, the promises, the covenants, the priesthood, but also the forefathers, Abraham, Isaac and Jacob and David, and also uh, Jesus Christ, who is the eternally blessed God, also came from this race or from this nation. Now look at what or how he writes or mentions about Jesus Christ. He calls Jesus Christ as the eternally blessed God. So as the eternally blessed God, you know, uh, so when people ask, ask, hey, where in the Bible does it say that Jesus Christ is God? This is one of the places, right? Um, uh, Romans chapter um, 9, verse 5, that he is the eternally blessed God. Okay. Verse 6 uh, on to verse um, 13. Before we go on to verse 6 to verse 13, can anyone has any questions? You all understood the first five verses? Okay. The silence, so okay, yes, no, Nina. You sorry, yeah, you mentioned about the first the verse that says about uh, I have great no confirming it in the conscience. No, my conscience confirms it in the Holy Spirit. Hmm. So, uh, conscience, uh, even before people know God, 
right? They do have a conscience, isn't yes. it? Yes. I mean, that's how God has created everybody. So they have yes. a conscience. Yes. So then uh, uh, you mentioned that the conscience is programmed by God. So uh, is that what it is in everyone? I mean, does God program or is the, does the conscience operate differently for different people is relative the Isn't conscience I mean, is programmed huh. sorry the conscience is programmed is by god to know what is right and wrong it's already programmed but we can't say that for one person the conscience is programmed only to do right no that means we're talking about predestination which is wrong god has programmed our conscience to know what is right and wrong so it's left up to us to choose because god has given us the gift of choice the gift of volition which he's going to talk about in detail right in in these chapters 9 10 11 and we can understand more but yes we know what is right and wrong and the choice depends on us you know to choose the right if we don't choose the right we choose the wrong we pay the consequences for that uh, no, my question is like when we uh, people who do not know God. I mean, when I say do not know God, do not have the sorry, we lost with you. God. Sorry, we lost you. Can you come again? Your question is yes. Uh, the people who do, can you hear me now? Yes. Uh, people who do not know God. I'm saying who do not have a relationship with God. So they also have a conscience, isn't? So they, they also have, we everybody. lost you there. So they also have a conscience everybody has uh, no conscience so they also have a conscience yes yes so what i'm saying is uh, doesn't the conscience operate according to the standard that it's being exposed to now I, what i'm saying is the conscience varies i'm not talking about people who know god okay there the holy spirit will confirm and things like that it's different but in general people on the whole everybody has a conscience but doesn't that conscience operate differently, relatively? You can have a defiled conscience, you can have a seared conscience. To, to one, the conscience says that you can't do certain things. To one, the conscience says you can do it. Doesn't it differ, um, is what I was saying. I mean, how do we understand conscience in the regular sense? And uh, the people who are in God, of, of course, it is an enlightened conscience because we have the Spirit of God to tell us exactly, you know, what... You know, according to God's word, and we have a very high standard. But to the regular people, uh, conscience doesn't operate that way, isn't it? Or, you know, okay, there will be this thing of right and wrong. But apart from that, even for a believer, we can't say they have an enlightened conscience. Yes, their conscience is, uh, can be enlightened with the word of God, God, depending yeah. on how much they feed their uh, their uh, their uh, uh, very you know fiber of their being with God's word, how much God's word is filling the sun. Likewise, their conscience is also being fed, and they know immediately what is right, what they have to be doing, what is the choice they have to make. But sometimes, even when we have, we think about your life and my life. Even you know, we have a conscience we know the holy spirit speaks to us tells us what to do what not to do we can still harbor hatred we can still harbor unforgiveness we can be still rude we can still uh, retaliate in our anger even if the holy spirit is saying don't speak back don't disobey don't judge we can still not listen to our conscience still not listen to the holy spirit and we can still go ahead and do what we want to do in the same case it is with the with the, uh, an unbeliever also they also know what is right and wrong right mm -hmm. just like we know what is right and wrong like it's not it's not right to judge somebody not right to talk back you know use uh, bad words or get angry or you know do things in anger say things in anger yes so it's important that we don't, uh, you know, give in to our conscience, whether we are believers or unbelievers. And, uh, you know, for a, a believer, if they are going to be spending more time in God's word, then, you know, their conscience is being strengthened by the word of God and also by the Holy Spirit. That's on. But we can see many of them, you know, simply don't listen to both their conscience and to the Holy Spirit. So, uh, the the conclusion would be that 
Okay, there's no real difference. I mean, when when it comes Sorry, to. Sorry, we can't hear you, Nina. I said, uh, is, there, is there no difference then? Uh, oh, okay. The others it's are okay. able Maybe to hear us. I'll, 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 I'll try and type it. I'll try and type it. No problem. Oh, you can hear us, Shiv Kumar. Okay. Oh, maybe the uh, online people can hear me, but not you. <laughs> it's, it's okay. Yeah, yeah, I think it keeps going and coming. Okay, now Francis yeah, I... is on, so you can say again, please. Yeah. Okay, so what I'm saying is there's no difference, uh, is it? I'm. Uh, the question is, is there no difference between the conscience of a believer and an unbeliever? That is what my question is. Yeah, the, everyone's conscience is the same. Yeah, you know, uh, we have a pre-programmed conscience, but a conscience of a believer, depending on how they are able to use the resources, the gifts that have been given to them, their conscience can be strengthened, can, uh, you know, just re align itself to God's word, and they know what to do at any given situation. Okay. Okay. Thanks. Did that help you or you're still confused? Not confused, but I thought there was a clear uh, this thing. I mean, uh, I would, I was, I would think, how would uh, an unbeliever know of those high standards of God, which we we have the? It, it's a different thing that okay, whether the believer chooses to obey or disobey, but uh, I would think uh, that's what that's what I thought that the believer would have a much high. He is being exposed to a very high standard, the standards of God, where we are not even supposed to think wrong. So will that will that standard be available to the unbeliever? No, that standard is not available not to available. an unbeliever. Yes, not uh, yes, that's what it's that's yes, what not I mean. available to an unbeliever, but also their conscience can, you know, of an unbeliever can bring them to that place of high standard as well. Yes. It, it, keep it can. This thing. Oh. Yes. It you, you know, even what about adultery? Take for a okay. uh, son. We don't have to just have God's word to tell us, hey, don't commit adultery, right? Or don't steal or don't mm -hmm. kill. Those are all yeah. high standards. Everyone yeah. knows I shouldn't be killing, I shouldn't be committing adultery, I shouldn't be looking at all of these, you know, uh, 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 material on uh, internet, which is wrong. Whether a believer or unbeliever, all of us know that. So there is a high standard because we are already programmed by God. You know, for for those high standards. Only thing is, what is a higher standard is that God's word and strengthens us, upholds us, and helps us, and encourages us. You know, to be strengthened in in these areas where we don't fall easily compared to an unbeliever. Yeah. Okay. 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 Thank okay. you. We, thank, you. Uh, thank you. Yeah. Sorry uh, to take time. Yeah. Can you put it on, please? Yeah. Okay, we'll uh, end class here. We've uh, finished. So I'll uh, do the rest of the uh, in um, recording so that you can listen to it. Uh, and then maybe if you have any questions, you can ask me uh, next class. Okay. Thank you all for joining class. Uh, please pray for us even as we go for our youth missions. I'll see you next week. Thank you. Uh, just before we stop, I stopped the recording. I've posted the um, the assessment too. So please kindly do that, e-learning students as well. Thank you.